Okay. And then tonight's presentation uh, will visit Southern Sicily at the crossroads of the Mediterranean and influenced by many different cultures throughout its history. While a part of Italy, Sicily has a distinct culture, dialect, cuisine, and attitude that makes it a place apart. We'll follow the south coast from Argent Agrigento <laughs> with its amazing assemblage of ancient Greek temples to the stunning Baroque hills towns of the southeast and finish up in the bustling city of Catania uh, in the shadow of Mount Etna. So please excuse me there, but I'm really excited to welcome Jeff Klapes here tonight. Um, and thank you so much. Oh, and if you have any questions, please direct them to the chat and we will collect all of those and ask them at the end of the program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jess, for the great introduction. Um, again, uh, as she said, my name is Jeff Klapes and I work at the reference department at the EV Library in Wakefield, which is about half an hour south of you guys in Chelmsford. Um, I, uh, being a reference librarian is my day job, but I have always loved to travel. Um, and I'm also an amateur photographer. So this is a way for me to kind of combine two things that I love um, into one. Uh, and uh, I love to share them with other people. I've always been kind of amazed at the degree to which um, the world is divided into people who like looking at other people's travel photos and people who hate looking at other people's travel photos. Um, so um, I'm pleased that there are so many of you here with, uh, with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna get started as, as Jess mentioned, um, this is being recorded. So if you know anyone who is unable to attend tonight, they'll be able to check it out later. Um, and if you have any questions, since this is such a large group, I think rather than um, just taking questions during the program, it will be easier um, if you either put them in the chat or we'll uh, have plenty of time at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions um, towards the end. And also I'll be sure to provide you with my email address so that if at any point later on, you ever have any questions, I'm always happy to help out in any way I can. That's part of what it's like being a librarian. So um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to first put Sicily on the map for you. Um, the red island right in the middle looks like the football that the boot of Italy is kicking. Um, Sicily is both figuratively and geographically at the crossroads of the Mediterranean. And because of that, it has a lot of influences from many different cultures over, um, over the centuries, um, starting with the original Sicilians, but also the Greeks, the Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Arabs, the Normans, the Byzantines. Um, blah, 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 on and uh, up until you get to the Ottomans and then the French and the Spanish and the British. And finally, in 1860, when um, the modern nation of Italy um, became an independent country in the modern sense, the Italians. And this trip, um, what you can see here is um, the red line is an indication of where I traveled in Italy. Um, we took probably about two weeks to um, drive independently around uh, the island. Um, and uh, I think to really do it justice, I would say you probably need at least 10 days. Um, two weeks gives you enough time to explore and not feel rushed. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking uh, specifically at the southern part of the island, which if you can see my pointer, um, we're going to start more or less here and work our way through the southern hills and then down to some very important and beautiful hill towns um, down in the southeast. We're going to stop in the um, historic city of Syracuse and then we'll work our way back up to Catania. Um, there is another program that I have that covers the north part of the island and um, we may be able to do that at some point in the future. Um, also just to throw some more maps at you, um, this is just um, an outline to give you a rough idea of how it compares to us here. This is a map of Massachusetts with the outline of Sicily put over it just to give you a sense that Sicily um, overall is not really roughly the size of the state of Massachusetts. Um, however, it has far fewer people. There's only about 5 million um, and that's only about 8% of the total population of the entire country of Italy. So it has always kind of been a place apart and a little wilder than many other parts of Italy. 
um, that are more visited. And to look at the landscape, um, the island is very, very mountainous, which makes it a beautiful place um, visually, um, particularly along the northern coast um, and also in the central islands here. But you can clearly tell from this image that the most noticeable feature, obviously, is this giant pimple over on the east coast, which is Mount Etna. Um, it is the largest and one of the most active volcanoes in Europe. Um, and it is 11,000 feet high, which um, in any mountain range would be um, a, a pretty uh, impressive statistic. But given the fact that it pretty much stands by itself um, along the coast, it is that much more dominant in the landscape, particularly on the east coast of the island. You can see it from significantly far away. So we're gonna work our way down um, the coast. And I just wanted to give you an idea of the typical traffic jam that you might encounter in Sicily. Um, and a little bit of the landscape of the Southern countryside. The Southern coast is much more gentle um, than the Northern coast where the mountains come right down to the sea. Um, on the South, there are a lot more beaches um, and a lot more, um, agricultural land. We're going to start in the small town of Caltabellata, which is a small town up in the mountains, about maybe 15-20 uh, minutes from the southern coast. It has about 3,500 people and it's 3,000 feet up in the mountains. The view from the top is spectacular, even on a cloudy day like um, you can see here. Uh, it's kind of shaped like an amphitheater along the sides of the, um, the curved mountains. Aside from its location and its, its stunning aspect, um, it really is only famous other than that for being the site of the Peace of the Sicilian Vespers, which you've probably never heard of. They happened in uh, 1302, but it was a very important historical point in Sicily um, when there was, after a long war between um, the, uh, the locals and the French who were governing the island at the time, with the help of the Aragonese in Spain, there was a truce um, and that ended the war and it was decided in this town. Um, way up at the top of the hill, there's a sort of stocky squat Norman cathedral. Um, you may wonder about Norman architecture in the southernmost part of Italy, but again, um, like so many other cultures um, that battled and fought and traded in the Mediterranean, um, the Normans were one of many that at certain points in its history did govern uh, the island. And here is kind of looking from the top across the countryside. On a clear day, you can't really see in this image, this is looking east, but on a clear day, way off in the distance, you would actually be able to see Mount Etna. You can climb to the very top of this little peak, which is called the Pizza de Caldebalata. Um, it is most likely an old volcanic cone um, that has since eroded. Um, and it's kind of hard to see from this photo, but there is actually a stairway carved into the side. And if your knees are good, you can go all the way to the top for amazing 360 degree views um, of the town below and also of the scenery. Um, in all directions. If we continue along the south coast, the beaches are really nice here, uh, probably more so than in the north, um, just because there's more of them. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very popular destination for Italians and all uh, Europeans of all kinds to come uh, for summer holidays. In addition, a little bit off the coast, there are some islands that are um, connected to Sicily historically and uh, politically. Um, you might have heard of Lampedusa, um, which is way off. You can't actually see it from the coastline. Um, and also another smaller one called Pantelleria. Um, and about maybe 60 miles south of Sicily is the island of Malta, or the I should say the islands of Malta, which is an independent nation um, that I have also visited and is well worth uh, going to because it has some incredible culture as well, although it's much smaller than Sicily. Um, this is um, an example of one of the unusual rock formations on the south coast. 
Um, this is called the Scala dei Turchi. Um, in other words, um, the staircase of the Turks. It's white limestone and in the sun, it's absolutely brilliant and is now a popular place for people to climb and just hang out along the beach. Um, also in this same uh, stretch of coastline, I had to make a uh, literary pilgrimage. I'm a fan of the Italian writer Luigi Pirandello. Um, he's probably one of Italy's most famous 19th and early 20th century writers. Um, he is most probably most famous um, for uh, his plays, including one called Six Characters in Search of an Author, which you may possibly have heard of. He also wrote an enormous number of short stories, many of which were made into films. Um, he was given the Nobel Prize in 1934. Um, and died only a couple of years later. So his house, um, which you can see here, um, very close to the southern coastline, um, is now a museum uh, where you can visit um, the, the home that he lived in. And also they have a, a range of exhibits relating to his life. It's very close to the city of Agrigento, which is kind of medium sized. It's about 60,000 people. So it's not a huge city. Um, but in terms of Sicily, it is. Um, although it's not that big a deal now, um, in ancient history, it was considered one of the most important and one of the largest cities in the ancient Greek world. Um, bear in mind that Sicily for a very long time was um, governed by the Greeks and was part of the Greek civilization in, in ancient times. We're talking 2000 years ago now. Um, and interestingly, you will find that some of the best Greek architectural ruins um, are actually not in Greece, but are in Italy, um, because they just happen to have survived because of their location. In Sicily, that's um, particularly true because many of them were um, way off in the countryside, so they were less likely to be affected by development later on in the centuries. So Agrigento is a really important site for people to uh, come and see the ancient culture, um, but it also has a more modern town. And when I say modern, I um, am referring relatively <laughs> because it's more of a Renaissance and Baroque town. So it's still quite old um, and we'll visit that as well in a couple of minutes. But the, the views of the ruins are spectacular with the glittering blue Mediterranean right behind them. Um, this is a view from the guest farmhouse that we stayed in, where you can see um, right down, it, it was within easy walking distance, in fact, of, of the place that we stayed, um, the um, complex of temples, which is called the Valley of the Temples. Um, I'm not quite sure why it's called that, because it's not a valley at all, it's actually on a ridge. Um, and there are seven temples that were built by the ancient Greeks roughly in the fifth and sixth century BC. Um, and this was originally the sacred part of a much larger and mostly unexcavated at this point um, city called Akragas, um, which is kind of where the Italian, uh, modern Italian name for the city comes from. You can see on the hillside in the back of this photo, the more modern town of Agrigento, which is just um, five or 10 minutes away by car. So you could easily spend an entire day exploring these ruins. Um, they are particularly lovely in either the very early morning or the late afternoon, just because the low light um, glows off of the limestone um, ruins and makes them particularly beautiful. This is the temple of the Dioscuri, Castor and Pollux, as they're known in Roman. Um, and again, another view north to the, the modern town. Um, one of the largest temples here is the temple to the Olympian Zeus, which is now almost completely destroyed, but you can still see examples of, um, it's kind of hard to tell here because he's laying down, but if you look at this sculpture, this is actually an example of a huge Atlas figure, Atlas the, um, the Titan, um, lying down on his back with his holding his arms up. And I'm going to show you, um, this is a model of a reconstruction of what they think this temple would have originally looked like. And it's quite unusual. You can see those Atlas figures 
here, there would have been scores of them all the way around building, holding up the pediment uh, of the structure. But there's almost nothing left of it except rubble at this point. There's also a temple to Hercules. And way down at the far end of this um, very long and elegant processional avenue is the Temple of Concordia, which is, of, of all the temples, it's the one in the best state of preservation. And that's partly because for um, many years, it was actually used as a church, a Christian church. And some of these photos will give you an idea of why I recommend going there in the afternoon because the, the setting sun uh, turns all of the temples into just these incredible golden structures with uh, really dramatic silhouettes against the sky. And always um, only um, Barely a half a mile away is the Mediterranean out over um, a series of olive groves and um, vineyards. This is the very last temple. If you're heading from west to east, this is the temple of Hera, um, or in the Roman pantheon of gods, she's known as Juno. And the countryside here is pretty much exactly what you would imagine out of any, um, if you've ever watched any Italian films, <laughs> um, it seems, um, I've seen an awful lot of Italian films that take place in Sicily and they all seem to have been um, filmed in like the 60s and 70s. Um, but it's amazing how much the countryside really hasn't changed um, as, as you drive around. It's, it's just incredibly gorgeous. Um, olives, as you can imagine, are one of the biggest crops um, in Sicily, um, and uh, wine grape growing is also um, very important. Those are probably the two biggest ones, but there's quite a bit of agriculture. As dry as Sicily is, um, the dryness is overall, um, but there are actually, uh, there's actually significant rainfall at certain times of year and in certain parts of the island, which allow it to be a very uh, rich agricultural breadbasket, essentially, of the Mediterranean, and it always has been. Um, again, we're just looking as the sun sets over the ruins. Um, this is not a terribly good photo, but um, I wanted you to see what it looked like from our guest house at night. They light up all the temples, so you can just see this incredible array of lit up Greek temples along the horizon. We stayed in a really nice uh, guest farm, um, which had peacocks, you can see here, it had other animals like dogs and chickens. Um, this, this was a mastiff who snored incredibly loudly and was much friendlier than he looked. He looks terrifying. Um, you would swear this is Cujo from the Stephen King novel, but actually he was a very lovely and friendly dog but um, boy, did he snore. Um, and we ate out on the terrace and enjoyed um, the company of the other guests and the views. Um, a, a important part of visiting Sicily is the food. Um, Sicily, of course, is Italian, but it's also a little bit not Italian. Um, and the influences of all those cultures, particularly from the Middle East and North Africa, um, have meant that Sicilian food is a slightly different take on the Italian food in the rest of the country. Um, and here's a good example. This is actually a breakfast dish. Um, these are balls of couscous um, that have been rolled up with fruit and nuts and dates and spices, cinnamon, things like that, honey, sesame seeds. Um, the food definitely has the influence of, a, uh, of North Africa and the Middle East. Here's our friend, the dog, um, while we eat breakfast, snoring away. Um, they also had a much smaller dog, which was easier to um, pet. And you can see him enjoying the sun as I was as well. Uh, 
I highly recommend if you travel there, avoiding large hotels because there are so many places to stay that are very inexpensive um, and really distinctive properties that um, are farms, uh, farm stays, small pensions. Um, they're really delightful and much more enjoyable to stay in than big fancy international style hotels. Sicily doesn't have a whole lot of those anyway, except in the cities. Um, but if you have a car and the independence to be able to go where you want, um, it, it makes for much more enjoyable traveling. Um, as I said, just a little bit inland and up on the top of the hill overlooking the temples is the quote unquote modern town of Agrigento, which is really um, modern only in the sense that it was about 1500 years later than the original one. Um, but it's still uh, a very typical Baroque Italian town with Renaissance and Baroque architecture, lots of churches, um, a very impressive cathedral and a couple of really good museums. Um, I need to talk a little bit about this guy um, because um, since you didn't see my presentation on the north part of Italy, you don't know about him yet. Um, this is a sculptor um, by the name of Giacomo Serpota, um, who was active during the Rococo period, which is kind of, was the tail end of the Baroque period in art when things just got a little out of control. And um, so Rococo uh, sculpture is extremely exuberant. It physically comes out from the walls. Um, it's very dramatic. And there's a lot of examples of it in uh, buildings around Sicily, particularly in the churches. And uh, Giacomo Serpota is one of the most famous examples of sculptors who worked in this style. Um, so here in Agrigento, this is the Monastery of Santo Spirito. And you can see some examples of just how incredible this is. Now, this is not marble, I need to emphasize. Um, the reason why this um, these sculptures are able to um, protrude from the walls the way they are without falling down is that they're actually made of stucco and plaster. Um, it was a very new way of working um, in church sculpture rather than the traditional Renaissance uh, marble sculptures that, that were done in previous centuries. So it allowed them to expand a little bit. And uh, it really is dramatic. There's uh, any number of tiny little churches um, that you could easily walk by in any Sicilian town. And if you bother to go inside, you'll see things like this and, and just be um, just be stunned. So you can stroll around Agrigento through very typical lovely Italian streets. Um, and I would certainly urge you not to miss the cathedral, which goes back to the 14th century. While we were there, it was under some renovations, but you can still see the incredible um, Baroque uh, exuberance in the apse here. And also, uh, if you look up at the ceiling, on the right-hand side here, you see the Baroque. Um, and on the left, which is looking towards the nave of the church, um, is a much more restrained Renaissance style. Um, and you can see that in the construction of the building over the centuries. Attached to the cathedral is a superb library um, with historic manuscripts. Um, and also an excellent art museum. So it's well worth visiting that as well. Um, a few blocks away is a tiny little church um, that you could almost miss called Santa, Ma Santa Maria dei Greci, which means St. Maria of the Greeks. Um, this is an even older church uh, from the 12th and 13th centuries, and it was built over a still older, very ancient temple to the god Greek goddess Athena. Um, and you can still see that below. They've redone the church to preserve the early ruins. So the floor of the, the nave actually has these glass blocks where you can look down and see the ancient Greek foundations. You can also go down below um, to see um, how the structure has evolved over, the, over time. And what we're looking at here um, these, these long sort of uh, stair steps are actually the base of the original Greek temple. 
um, what would have been around the outside. And you can just up here see um, a little bit of the remaining base of one of the fluted columns of the original temple. So most of that is gone except for the foundations. Um, but it's nice the way they have preserved the building in a way that you can see its history um, very visually. Um, I'm a fan of little Italian cars, so I had to take a picture of the original Fiat 500, um, which was built from, uh, manufactured from 1957 to the mid 1970s when they stopped producing them. You will still see quite a few of them on the road. They're tiny little clown cars, um, and they are the quintessential Italian city car. Um, and they do make them again. In fact, I own one. They started in about 10 years ago making new versions that are a, a modern take on the original classic for the 50th anniversary of the original. So um, here in Massachusetts, I own a white Fiat that looks exactly like what you see in this picture. It's a great little car. Um, and of course, coincidentally, when we were in Italy, that's exactly what we got for our rental car, the car that looked exactly like what we had at home. Um, the only problem with it is there are so many white Fiats driving around Italy that it can be <laughs> difficult sometimes um, to find yours in a parking lot. To this day, I still don't remember which of these was ours. I would have to look up the, the license plate. Um, moving further east, um, we're going to head inland a little bit to the mountain town called Enna. Um, and really, it is in, in the interior of Sicily. It's about the only good sized town that isn't on the coast. Um, maybe say 25,000 people. And it is very perched very high on a protected outcrop with views in all directions. Um, and on a clear day, Mount Etna um, over on the East Coast is clearly visible um, from the, the center of Enna. It also has a, a impressive cathedral and a number of very imposing public buildings and just very beautiful um, public piazzas, the Italian word for square, um, and also some interesting architecture from different time periods. What I'm showing you here are, um, uh, there's a government building and a post office from the 1930s. Um, there was a lot of fascist era architecture built in Italy during that time period. Um, and some of it still exists and it has the very modern 20th century look that that, that era has. Um, all over the world, and it owes a little bit to Art Deco. Um, you can see some of those very clean modern lines. There's also a very old castle um, that was built, uh, rebuilt many times um, over the centuries and now is a public park at the end of the town. And from there, you get a fantastic view of another town just a few miles away called Kalashibeta, um, which is just north. Um, and the view from the Palisades uh, in Enna, where the, where the public park is, are just picture postcard perfect. We stayed not far from there in a, uh, another farm stay, um, which in Italian is called an agro, agriturismo. And um, these are converted farmhouses, some of which are still operating farms, but they rent out rooms. This one actually was not a farm, it was a monastery, um, but it has been converted into an organic farm and they rent out um, several rooms um, to guests and they also have uh, home cooking with produce from their farm. So it's a, it's a beautiful building, um, kind of on the outskirts of Enna, um, very peaceful at night, beautiful view over the countryside and only, I think, five or six rooms um, in a little wing off to the side. Very comfortable, small, private bathrooms. And um, none of the places that we stayed in Sicily cost more than $100 US per night um, with a private bathroom and with breakfast um, to give you a rough idea of prices. This was uh, about two years ago. And I'm particularly fond of any um, 
place to stay that provides its own pets for you to play with. Um, this had both dogs and cats. And it was a perfect jumping off point for seeing a lot of the sites that are in this part of Sicily, um, including Piazza Armerina, which is a, another of the hill towns. Um, you may notice as we go through um, that most of the towns I'm showing you are built on hills or mountains even. Um, and that's absolutely true. That was certainly done for defensive purposes. Um, there are very few towns in Sicily that are built down in a, in a valley. Um, and this is another good example of that. Not very touristy, um, but um, this is another town that goes back a very long way and was mostly developed under the Normans when the Normans were in, uh, on the island. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's dominated by its massive Baroque cathedral um, and houses and, and shops spilling down the sides of the mountains. Um, but it's, it's a good base for visiting one of the most important sites in all of Sicily. Um, if you do any kind of tour of Sicily, they will um, certainly make this one of the most important uh, starred places to visit. Um, the Villa Romana del Casale is a third century AD um, villa from ancient Rome. So we're, we're further on than the Greeks now. We're into ancient Rome when the Romans were um, governing Sicily. And it has one of the best collections of ancient mosaics anywhere on the planet. If you are at all interested in ancient art, it is a must see. Um, the villa was submerged um, at various points in its past by mudslides and floods that preserved all of the mosaics in much the same way that um, lava and ash preserved the ruins and mosaics at Pompeii, um, mud did the same thing here. So once the excavations were complete, um, there's an incredibly um, superb intact example of an ancient Roman villa. It's not known exactly who the owner of this property was, um, but it was clearly someone of extreme wealth, probably from the imperial family or at the very least someone from the senatorial class, um, because the entire um, complex is over 3,500 square meters. Um, so that's probably comparable to the square footage of the Chelmsford Library, if not even bigger. Um, and this would have been not only a home for this person to, uh, to live in, but also to hold court and receive visitors and um, conduct the daily life of a wealthy Roman. Here is uh, a diagram just to show you of what uh, a reconstruction of what the villa would have looked like and how extensive it was. Um, and on the left is one of the most famous of the mosaics in the complex. Um, which is referred to now as the bikini athletes um, for obvious reasons. But um, there's a number of mosaics that depict ancient um, gymnastic and sports events. And this is one of the better known ones. The mosaics are in absolutely incredible condition. Um, and they have reconstructed the um, ruins to protect them, but also to be uh, approximately the size of the original structure, so it gives you a good feel um, for how big it would have been um, in its in its heyday. Um, it's it's really well presented. Um, this central hallway um, is called the Long Hall of the Great Hunt, and it's about two hundred feet long and um, runs all the way through the center of the complex. And this single mosaic, 200 foot long mosaic, depicts the hunting of exotic animals that were brought back to Rome um, from Africa. You can see a good example of that on the right where there's a rhinoceros depicted. And here is um, the central basilica with a reconstruction of the roof um, showing how big it probably would have been when it was originally um, its, its original size. This was the main audience hall for whoever lived here, um, where dignitaries would have been greeted and formal events would have been held. Um, instead of mosaics, interestingly, this floor, um, the floor in this room has no mosaics, but only um, a, an extensive combination 
of rare marble tiles, different kinds of marble from different parts of the world, um, all put together in a single floor. Um, but to find all of these mosaics in one central location in such condition is, is really quite incredible. Um, and uh, along with Pompeii, it is probably one of the, the most singular places for this kind of art anywhere in the world. This, this picture shows um, the Greek myth of Odysseus um, and the Cyclops Polyphemus. You can see his one eye in his forehead taken from the Odyssey. Um, this is another place where you could easily spend probably half a day um, if, if you're interested enough in, in the art. And even if you aren't, um, it's still worth visiting. And the, the presentation and explanation of uh, everything that they do is so well done that I think um, it, you'd be hard pressed not to find something interesting in it. Um, in the area around this, um, I mentioned earlier, it's, it's much more rolling countryside than mountainous um, the way you'd find in the north. And this is a photo um, from pretty much right next to the highway, actually, of an unusual crop, which I did not expect to find there. Um, after Mexico, Sicily is actually the second largest producer in the world of prickly pear cactuses. Um, they grow all over the Mediterranean. Um, just the way they grow in the southwest U.S. here, um, but I had never actually seen them grown as a crop um, as opposed to a wild plant. And what you're looking at here is an actual farm that is growing rows of prickly pears, and they harvest the fruits. Um, you can actually eat the fruits as a sort of third thirst quencher, um, but it's also used in preserves and juices and condiments. They make liquors out of it um, and even skin care products. And again, heading east, we're gonna stop in another hill town called Caltagirone, which is another um, typical good-sized inland town, but this one is known in particular for its ceramics, especially Majolica. Um, and there are museums for that um, in the town, but also there are any number of places publicly where you can see um, how the tradition of ceramics in this town um, is displayed in the architecture, um, like on the dome of the church in the background. And um, the steps that lead up to the main church in town um, is called the Staircase of Santa, Mar Santa Maria del Monte, which has 142 steps, and each, each stair is decorated with completely different ceramic tiles. Here's a close-up to give you a better idea. Once a year during the Saints Festival, um, uh, the devout will um, climb the stairs on their knees um, and the entire staircase is lit with candles. When you get to the top, there's um, more ceramics in the, the balustrade and also this, um, what looks like a mosaic here is actually painted ceramic tiles. You can buy ceramics like this all over um, Sicily, and particularly in this town. And there's no shortage of incredible churches, mostly, again, from the Baroque and Renaissance periods. This is just a perfectly ordinary traffic bridge over one part of the town to the other, but it's um, covered with tiles. And the main public park in the town also has ceramics. Here's their bandstand. And they have a museum of ceramics as well um, that showcases the history of ceramic um, production in the town, as well as all over Sicily. Um, this is a beautiful Art Nouveau uh, theater that is still operational now as a cinema and an, a very unusual facade of a uh, church completely covered with ceramics. This is, um, I loved this building because we kind of came upon it in a, a narrow little neighborhood that you wouldn't have expected to find anything this grand, um, but it has such an unusual facade. 
And what you're seeing here are, um, are all gold and dark blue ceramics. Um, heading back down to the coast, we're going to focus on the corner of um, the, the southeasternmost corner of Sicily, um, where there are a number of very beautiful hill towns that are probably the, the, the be better known ones, the more famous ones, if you were making a quick tour of the island. We stayed in this um, farmhouse. This is a, another of those agriturismos, which is a working farm built in the mid 1700s. Um, and now mostly what they grow are lime orchards. Um, we were the only people to be staying here at the time. This, this trip, I, I should mention, was in um, early October. So the weather was very nice, um, not, not hot the way it is in the summer. Um, they had actually had a considerable amount of rain that summer, which was unusual. And this particular part of the island um, on, perhaps surprisingly, has some very beautiful wetlands, the same kind of wetlands that you might see up around um, Ipswich here in Massachusetts or down on the south coast in Plymouth Duxbury. Um, you don't think of Italy as having that kind of landscape, but um, coastal marshes are actually um, a, quite a common sight in this part of Sicily. And this uh, place that we stayed was just maybe a 15, 20 minute walk from the oceans. Uh, from the ocean where there is an actual wetland reserve that they um, uh, they use for migrating birds. You know. Unfortunately, it was very wet while we were there, um, so we had to slog through mud and rain, but um, here's some of the limes that they grow in that place. The advantage of being the only people there were we could pretend we lived in it, um, like this was our castle. Um, and what they've done is they've converted the, um, the more utilitarian parts of the structure um, into guest houses. Um, so we stayed in this little, lovely little area. And we had this gigantic room um, along with a couple of other rooms in the back to ourselves. Um, you can tell from here, um, this was originally part of the barns where the livestock would have been kept. So. Um, cattle and probably more likely horses would have um, been stable in this barn and this was the feed trough um, for them. Now it's just um, a place for guests to stay. But it was huge and it came with its own kitchen, um, separate bath, very comfortable, very inexpensive. And in the morning they prepared us a massive breakfast um, in this room that um, would normally have had a lot more guests in it, but it was just the two of us, which was kind of nice. There was a wild thunderstorm the night that we stayed in this place, and we actually lost power um, for a little while, which made it even more like being in an a Italian film from the 1970s. Um, this is a view of the orchards um, around uh, the farmhouse looking towards the ocean. And again, um, we were pleased to have company uh, to amuse us while we were there. There were uh, a whole batch of new kittens, including the runt of the litter, who um, they were worried about his health, but I guess um, they had taken him to the vet and said he was doing okay. So if you head down to the ocean, you would never think that this is Italy, but it is. Here's a huge flock of flamingos in the wildlife sanctuary. Um, and because of the shallow mud flats um, in these uh, salt marshes, it's an ideal spot for migrating birds to stop um, on their way to and from in, in between Europe and Africa as they migrate from one continent to the other. Um, I want to take you on a quick tour of the most important hill towns in this area which if you were to look at a guidebook of Sicily, these are the ones that they're gonna recommend that you visit um, because they are certainly the most famous and the most important ones. Um, and they all have um, a number of things in common. Um, they're built on hills. They have very similar styles of architecture. And part of that is because they all suffered the same disaster in 1693 when an enormous earthquake struck the Eastern Mediterranean 
and destroyed huge uh, areas, not just in Italy, but elsewhere. Um, so much of, much of Eastern Sicily was damaged or destroyed during that earthquake. Um, and as a result, um, in subsequent decades, a lot of building happened in a very short period of time. So the cities and towns that um, reconstructed themselves after the disaster were built with a very particular Baroque style um, that is seen throughout the entire town or city. So it, it's a very um, homogeneous look to the, to the town. And like any of them, um, they're all built on the slopes of the mountains um, for protective purposes. And every building has um, incredible detail on it. Very close to uh, Modica is the Modica Viaduct, um, uh, obviously a much more modern construction. Um, it was built in the late 1960s, believe it or not, and it's one of the highest in Europe. These pylons um, that hold it up as it crosses the valley are over 400 feet high. And if you continue up this valley um, at the confluence of a couple of rivers, you'll find Marika, um built up the slopes um, to the very tops of the hills. Very close to Mordica is um, a castle that's worth worth visiting. If you like country homes, like you might visit in um, England or other parts of Europe, um, there aren't too many of them in, in Sicily, um, but there are a couple and this is by far the most well-known. Um, I don't know if anybody has read Giuseppe de Lampedusa's uh, famous novel, The Leopard, which was also made into an equally famous film a few decades ago. Um, the name of this castle will sound familiar because Donna Fugata is the name of the house um, that is described in, in the historical novel. Um, however, um, the book takes place in Palermo, which is on the north coast, and this is nowhere near there, um, although the style of the house is very similar. Um, and there was originally a house on this property um, back as far as the 14th century, but the what you're seeing here in this model um, is a completely rebuilt structure from the 19th century. It was built in the 1860s by a local baron who chose the Venetian Gothic style. Um, if you've either visited or at least seen pictures of Venice, you can definitely see that in the Gothic style of the windows. And um, so the tiny villa that used to be here was expanded into this enormous structure, which now has over 120 rooms and some really beautiful gardens. So the interiors have been restored and you can explore at will. You can see this is a very 19th century look. Um, and again, if you've read the novel or seen the film, um, you could imagine um, the family in uh, of Donna Fogata in Palermo in this building. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it takes place in the late uh, 19th century and focuses on sort of the end of a uh, an important um, wealthy patrician Italian family as Italian politics are changing after independence. Um, and moving towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, it has a little bit of the air of Downton Abbey um, in the sense that it's, it's a very wealthy family and you trace them over a couple of generations as the family um, experiences the changes in politics in the outside world. Um, and just like in Downton Abbey where uh, the 19th century older generations had to give way to the changing world after World War I, um, the leopard kind of tells the same story about an earlier period in Italy. Um, we happened to be there on a day when it had been booked by um, a family for a wedding. 
which was painfully beautiful. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine having the money to um, rent Donna Fogata for my wedding, but there you have it. Some people do. Um, so boy, did they get some great wedding photos. Um, here you can see some of the gardens. And in fact, um, it even has its own maze. Unlike a lot of the mazes elsewhere that you might have seen that are made out of hedges, this one is actually built in stone. Um, so it's not going anywhere. But at least you can climb up on top of the wall and figure out how to get out if you get stuck. And here is one of my favorite photos that just to me is Italy. Here's a little Italian Fiat um, with a couple who was at the wedding. The Italians are certainly the most, of, of all the places I've ever traveled, the Italians are by far the most stylish and they do it effortlessly. Um, here's another view of the countryside around that area. Um, the stone walls that you can see are very typical and you can imagine why, because Sicily is extremely rocky. So if you're going to clear the fields, you might as well do something constructive with the rocks. So you build buildings and you build stone walls. And that's why you'll see them pretty much everywhere across the countryside. Um, speaking of style, um, there's old Italian style and then there's modern Italian style. I did not actually see anybody walking down the street who looked like this though. Um, the next and even more famous of the um, Baroque hill towns in what's called the Val de Noto, um, the Valley of Noto, which is this, this southeastern corner of the island, um, is called Ragusa. This is a much bigger town. It's about 75,000 people, and it's very old. It goes back um, 3,000 years, but most of its growth happened during the Byzantine era, um, maybe a thousand years ago. But again, like the other cities in this area, it was destroyed in 1693 and pretty much what you see today was completely rebuilt after that time period. Um, this is an aerial view um, from Google to show you how um, the old city, which is this little bit over here um, called Ragusa Ibla and the modern town, which is Ragusa Superiore. Um, this is actually a little bit higher. Um, both of them are on very steep hills, but you can tell that this is older by all the narrow, twizzly little streets, whereas the more recently constructed city has uh, much more of a grid pattern. Um, this is an exquisitely beautiful city. It's been used in many different um, films and TV shows. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever read, but I would highly recommend um, the series of um, Inspector Montalbano um, uh, mystery, murder mysteries that all take place in Sicily, uh, Sicily by Andrea Camilleri. And I want to say there's about 20 of them. They're very quick reads um, and they all take place in this tiny corner of um, Sicily with uh, a really great main character who is a police detective. Um, and it has also been turned into a TV series um, which you can get on, uh, it is possible to stream it through uh, different ser uh, streaming services. And the, uh, the film versions are extremely um, true to the original novels. Um, and they are filmed in this area. So if you've traveled there, um, you'll see a lot of the locations that we're looking at um, used in the, in the city. And in fact, Ragusa, is the fictional town where most of those stories take place. This is the cathedral um, from the 18th century of San Giorgio. Um, and it's famous for its um, beautiful facade, Baroque facade with all these um, different layers like a cake um, and the long elegant stairway that leads up to it from the piazza. There was actually a, a, a wedding taking place there as well um, the day that we happened to be there. The inside of the church is 
rather unexpected, um, given all the the gloopy Baroque exterior stuff. Um, the inside is actually quite uh, classical, um, but still very beautiful. And if you stand on the front steps and look down, this is the main piazza for the old town of the city, and it's surrounded by cafes. And even on a gray day like this, um, it's just a beautiful place for strolling and wandering around, uh, visiting the shops and then stopping and having something to eat, which in this case was a salad, um, a very typical Sicilian salad with oranges, onions, anchovies, some olives, um, and mozzarella, fresh mozzarella. Um, there's also um, a good red wine to go with it. Um, the probably one of the best known wines from Sicily is a very robust red called Nero Davola, uh, which um, is exported a lot. You can find it in stores all over, all around here. Um, it's very inexpensive, but quite good. Um, I found another one that I really like called Cera Suolo, which I have had a harder time finding here. Um, but Sicily is, um, because of its very rich volcanic soil, um, wine grape growing is, it, it's a perfect place for it. And they have both very good, mostly dry red, uh, white wines, but also very good robust reds. And they tend to be real, pretty inexpensive. Um, and you can finish off your lunch with um, a cannoli freshly filled um, from a bakery. Um, and this is looking from uh, the newer part of the town to the older part of the town um, off in the distance where you can see um, the different tiers of streets um, and their buildings kind of sprinkled down the hillside. The very large building that you can see way off at the top in the distance is part of the University of Ragusa. And just a number of street scenes to give you an idea of uh, the architecture. Um, I, I was an art history student, so that's why you see a lot of focus on the architecture and art um, of, of where we're looking. Um, part of that is because Italy is just, there's so much art that you can't, <laughs> um, everywhere you turn there's art. Um, but I have a personal interest in architecture because that's what my focus was in, in, in my studies. And Italy has a, a grand history of architecture going um, from the ancients um, all the way up to the 20th century and the 21st even. Um, this is another of um, the churches. I wanted to show you this in particular because this was a convent um, and the little boxes that you can see here and here are where um, nuns who were either not permitted to be on in the sanctuary of the church during services or wealthy uh, notable people who just simply didn't want to be seen mingling among the masses um, could observe religious services um, unseen from way up at the top. Ragusa also has a beautiful public garden. Um, you can tell you're in the Mediterranean because of all the um, palm trees. Um, and it's out on the, the spur at the end of the town, looking out over the valley. Um, there is also here another, another little church. The, every one of the towns that I'm showing you has probably 30 or 40 churches in them. Each one would have been uh, devoted to a particular neighborhood. This is the cathedral of the town, the old town called um, St. John, or I'm sorry, of the new town rather, um, uh, dedicated to St. John the Baptist. And it also has quite a dramatic interior. And here's some more examples of that, um, uh, the Serpoto Rococo um, plaster work, stucco work that I mentioned earlier on back in Agrigento. Uh, this is another of the churches that he was known for doing a lot of interior for, work for. 
one thing I wasn't able to figure out um, in Italy, and I, I noticed this was true in much of Southern Italy and also in Malta, which is not far away, um, you have these beautiful Catholic churches that have brilliant neon lights used in some of the chapels. And I was never quite sure why that was a popular thing to do. Um, but here you have the sublime and the ridiculous. Here is a, um, a gift shop where in addition to ceramic plates, um, you can buy a dress made entirely of pasta shells. And here is the post office, which is another good example of that more modern 1930s um, fascist Italian era architecture that there are a few examples of here and there. Um, we're going to finish up by working our way back up the coast um, and stopping in Syracuse, which is the fourth largest city in Sicily. Um, very important historically, probably more so than many of the other places we visited because it's so old. Um, and it, it figures very importantly in the ancient um, time, time of the island. When Greece uh, was in control of Sicily, um, Syracuse rivaled Athens as the most important city in the entire Greek world, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And you can see from this map probably why that was the case. It has a very well-protected harbor. Um, the historic city itself is mostly concentrated on this little spit of land, which is actually a, a separate island called Ortigia. Um, and there were, at various points during uh, in history, there were some important battles that took place in this bay. Um, in fact, probably the most important one was in the late fifth century BC, when during the Peloponnesian War, Athens, um, the city-state of Athens, suffered a major naval defeat here, one of their first, um, and it was instrumental in turning the tide uh, of the Peloponnesian Wars. These are some uh, buildings at the entrance to the city, another of those uh, Venetian Gothic style uh, mansions. And as you cross, um, there's a little bridge where you cross from the new city into the old. And there you will see a statue of Archimedes. I'm sure you've heard of him, the Greek mathematician and astronomer. Um, and the statue is here because he was born here. So you think of him as an ancient Greek, and he was. Um, but he was actually born in what is now modern Italy, because at the time of when, when he was around, this wasn't Italy, it was Greece. And as you enter the old city, um, you, you see this ancient history right up front, right away. This is a sixth century BC temple. Um, so again, we're talking back in the, the height of the early Greek period. Um, <clears throat> this is a temple to Apollo and you can still see the foundations. Um, this elegant square has a much more recent fountain um, of the goddess Diana, the Roman goddess. But in all of the city, the biggest attraction is the cathedral. Um, and you wouldn't think that from seeing it on the exterior, which looks very um, fortified and bland, um, but it isn't. It's one of the most fascinating bu buildings in all of Sicily. You can see it better here. Um, this cathedral was originally a fifth century BC Doric temple. So we're talking very early in the development of Greek architecture, um, a temple to Athena, the goddess. Over a thousand years later, um, the Catholic church um, built in the seventh century AD and incorporated the existing temple, the, the old Greek temple into the new structure. Um, then it went through a period of about 300 years under the Ottomans when it was a mosque. And then in 1693, you'll remember that date because of the big earthquake, um, the 1693 earthquake heavily damaged the building and it was completely reworked after that um, in the Baroque style. And they stuck um, what you can see, this is the, actually the front of the building here. Um, they stuck a big Baroque facade on the front. But if you look at it from the side, you get a really good view of the original Doric columns, 
which are now just incorporated into the walls. The front entrance is totally different and completely Baroque with these incredibly dramatic spiral columns that are uh, very similar to the ones that you would see in St. Peter if you've been there. Um, this shows you a plan um, color-coded to give you an idea of the different time periods. The darkest area with the, the black is the original structure, the original Greek structure, um, and then the seventh century additions, and then the Baroque uh, completion. So it's, it's a fascinating building, um, but it's also extremely beautiful. Uh, the interior is probably unlike any cathedral you've ever been in um, as a result of this, because it has all these layers of history on top of each other, including gorgeous mosaics from the Roman period, um, marble, and the, um, the Doric columns quite visible. The interior is actually kind of austere um, and really looks like an early Roman basilica, um, which it, in essence, actually was. But when they added all the Baroque stuff on, the altar was added, so you have this elaborate marble, light fixtures, and mosaics in the ceiling. Um, there's a, a number of side chapels that have relics, which are very important um, to the city, including those of St. Lucy. Um, these are not actually the relics of St. Lucy. Um, they're somebody else, but um, St. Lucy is the patron saint of the city. Um, so there's a lot, um, there's a lot of uh, imagery uh, related to her life in the building as well. And here's the exterior um, of the West Front that faces onto this incredibly um, elegant square. Um, this is a cath the cathedral square that's sort of in a half moon shape. So one, the, the side with the cathedral is straight, and then there's a curved um, side on the other side that um, at night it's lit up and it's just, it's an absolutely magical public square. The building that you see on the right here, this massive, structure here is the bishop's palace that would go along with the cathedral. And Syracuse, like the hill towns further inland, um, suffered the same fate um, as they did with the earthquake. So a lot of the reconstruction happened during that time period. Um, and the whole city is very Baroque at this point. Um, at the op opposite end of that big cathedral square is this tiny church that is kind of unassuming. Um, it's the Church of Santa Lucia alla Badia, um, and it is dedicated to St. Lucy, the patron saint I just mentioned. Um, and it's a pretty little church, but the main reason you might want to visit it is that there's a very famous painting of the burial of St. Lucy by Caravaggio. Um, it's a huge painting, and it fills most of the apse. Um, at this point. And Syracuse is just a lovely town to stroll around. Um, I'm kind of sorry it, it rained while we were there, but um, if it does rain, um, that's a perfect excuse to find a good place to sit and eat or drink for a while, um, which is what we did. Um, the thing that you can see off in the distance is very unusual. This is the um, the modern Catholic church, which was built in the late 20th century. So it's, it's this very sort of strange 1970s spaceshipy building. Um, and I'm very glad they built it outside the historic center. Um, another place that people like to stop is along the coastline here is the Fountain of Arethusa, which is a natural freshwater spring. Another of the reasons why this um, protected bay was such um, a good place to found a city. Um, Arethusa, in, according to mythology, is um, this is where the nymph uh, named Arethusa took shelter after she had been hunted by Alpheus. Um, so it's one of the lesser known stories in ancient mythology, but this is where it supposedly took place. And it now is a, um, 
uh, it still is a freshwater spring. Um, but the city is protected on all sides by these walls, um, which you can walk around uh, for really dramatic views. And inside, um, there are delightful little hidden squares, narrow streets, um, fun things to stumble upon. And of course, really good restaurants. Um, on the left is um, pasta with squid ink, um, which has a very um, unusual, very delicate flavor. Um, it, it, the, the concept turns people off a little bit, but it's actually delicious. And it has a hint of the ocean to it, but not too much. Um, and on the right, um, some other very typical things. This is a caprese salad um, with mozzarella, fresh basil, um, good tomatoes, and caponata, which um, is a dip um, that's very easy to make with onions and uh, peppers and tomatoes and eggplant, olive oil, garlic, um, little vinegar. And it, it's very easy to cook down, caramelize, and then you can serve it with bread. Um, you can eat it warm, you can eat it cold. Um, it's delicious in, in many ways. Um, you can also buy ceramics here, of course, and limoncello, another of my favorites. Um, I think I did mention it at one point earlier that um, when we were there, Sicily had actually had some major rainstorms. Um, and August, the month of August, a couple months before we were there, was unusually rainy. I think they said they had something like 10 or 12 days of torrential rain, which you might think would be good for agriculture, but actually it's not because um, the soil in the summer tends to be very dry, very brittle, um, and heavy, quick flash rainstorms cause flash flooding and can actually be more damaging to the crops um, than if no, no rain had happened at all. Um, and so it was actually not a great year for them because of all this rain that came in uh, strange bursts at times of year when they didn't normally expect it. And it caused problems like this. Here we are trying to get gas at a gas station. Um, and in a very short period of time, this, this um, big thunderstorm came through and flooded that whole end of the city. Um, as we head to the end, um, I'm going to quickly take you through Noto, which is um, the last of these beautiful hill towns. Um, and it's maybe 25,000 people, the smallest of them, actually, but it has 35 churches. Um, and again, like the others, destroyed by the earthquake, rebuilt in this very um, distinct Sicilian Baroque style. Um, of all the towns that we've looked at, this is probably the single most beautiful and elegant um, because it was almost deliberately designed to be a stage set. Um, it was unlike the others, it was built on a grid plan um, and all out of this beautiful local golden limestone. It's barely two miles from the sea. You can actually see the ocean from it. Um, but it feels a whole world apart. This is the Monastery of San Salvatore. And just around the corner is the oval church of the, the Chiesa di Santa Chiara, which has this striking oval interior um, with very unusual decorations. And another one of those um, screens where um, people could observe um, the uh, mass down below without actually being in the service itself through these little windows. Um, if you climb to the top of this church, you get a great view of downtown um, Noto. This is the main square in the city and it's featured in many different um, TV and uh, TV shows and films over the years. Probably one of the most famous is La Ventura, which is a very well-known classic Italian film um, from, I want to say, the early 1960s. And there's a couple of scenes in the end that are filmed in this, this square. Um, the cathedral, we'll look at the cathedral in, in just a minute. It's much nicer on the outside than it is on the inside. But all of these um, stairs and terraces 
were really designed to be, um, it, it's, it's a way for people to be seen. The whole idea is you would stroll up and down these now pedestrianized streets. Um, there are palaces, um, buildings for the archdiocese. Um, there are important municipal buildings and all the way along, um, you can imagine people dressing in their finest um, to see and be seen. The interior of the church, um, as I said, is actually not all that interesting. And part of that is because um, of more recent damage. Um, the dome, this huge dome that you can see on the left, um, completely collapsed in 1996 and took a lot of the interior decoration of the church with it. Um, and it was a full decade before they were able to do the reconstruction and reopen it. Um, so the inside of the church is now almost completely painted white and they, um, there are artists creating new frescoes in a much more modern style, um, gradually filling the different blank parts of the cathedral. But it's gonna take quite a while to, to do it all. Just across the square is the Ducal Palace, which is now used as the city hall. And here I am trying to look elegant and Italian. I'll leave it up to you whether I'm succeeding. And I just wanted to show you some more good examples of Baroque. Um, the, the Baroque style almost ends up being like a, like a literal theatrical stage set. Um, with uh, the different levels rising up from the street. The main street is now completely pedestrianized and full of cafes and shops, theaters. And at the entrance to the city or the exit, if you're going out that way, um, this is the Porto Reale, which was built in 1838 when um, when uh, it was visited by a king. Uh, it has the three symbols of Noto on the top, symbols of the city. The tower is a symbol of strength. Um, the dog symbolizes loyalty and the pelican symbolizes self-sacrifice. Most people walk through this gate without ever knowing that or caring because what you're heading for is this. <laughs> there are, um, there's just a, an endless series of delicious restaurants and bakeries um, where you can get things like this, delicious Italian pastries. And I'm going to finish up in Catania, which is the second largest city in Sicily. Um, there's over a million people there. Um, the largest, in case you're curious, is the capital, which is Palermo, up on the north uh, coast, northwest coast. Um, Etna, ten, uh, I'm sorry, Catania tends to be overlooked a lot because um, it's, uh, it and Palermo are the two main places that you would fly into. And very often people fly into the airport at Catania and then never bother to see the city. Um, and it's a shame because um, it's a fascinating city um, and very beautiful and doesn't tend to get as much tourism as you might otherwise expect. It's well worth at least a day or two. Um, one of the things that makes it interesting, of course, is that it's completely overshadowed by the giant mountain, uh, the volcano of Mount Etna. Our hotel was actually just up here in this little corner building off the main piazza where the cathedral is located. And the buildings um, and indeed the streets are very black and white. And the reason for that is that with Mount Etna so close um, there's a significant amount of lava stone and they used it to build. So there's a very distinctive Catanian architectural style where you have the contrast of black and white. Um, and even the paving stones of the street, you can see are black. And most of that is lava stone that is being reused from the area around it. There's also a long tradition in Sicily of puppet theaters marionettes. Um, you can still see performances there um, and you can buy reproductions or antiques um, 
of the the puppets that they use in the theaters. We didn't actually get to see one, and that's because I didn't realize that they're so popular that you really should book ahead. So if you ever plan to travel there and are interested in this, make sure you try to arrange um, tickets to a performance before you go, because they sell out very quickly. Um, the cathedral for Catania is dedicated to St. Agatha, and it was founded um, over a thousand years ago by the Normans, but what you see here is, again, as you can imagine, um, rebuilt after the earthquake in 1693. So like all the other parts of um, Sicily that we've seen today, um, very elegant, very Baroque, very public facing onto elegant squares where um, people will congregate. Agatha is the patron saint of the city. So that's why um, the, the main church is dedicated to her. And another good sacred and profane um, kind of image. Here's a historical um, uh, traditional marble font. Um, or if you want to show your religiosity in the modern way, you can pay a dollar or a euro, one euro for a plastic saint um, out of a vending machine. Um, also in the square right in front of the cathedral is this unusual statue with a, an elephant sculpture made out of lava. Um, this is another symbol of the city and an Egyptian obelisk on top. Just some more street scenes. Catania has 90 churches um, in a fairly small geographical area. Um, and in many parts of the city, you can see not only the layers of um, political history and architectural history, but actual natural history, because um, early on, back in 2000 years ago, when we're talk going back to ancient Greece and Rome, um, the level of the city was considerably lower. And as successive eruptions of Etna have happened over the years and flowed down into the city, um, modern versions of the city have been built on top. So you actually see different layers. This is an ancient Roman amphitheater in one of the big public squares. And it's sunken because back then the level of the city was considerably lower than um, the modern street level that you see today. The last major eruption occurred in 1669 and it damaged part of the city and also filled much of the harbor um, but otherwise didn't do too much damage except for a significant amount of ash. Um, this is the largest, uh, I'm sorry, the second largest Benedictine monastery in Europe after one in Portugal. It's kind of a weird looking building, um, but it's very big and open inside. And it's interesting because it has this meridian line um, in the floor of the church, which if the uh, sun cooperates, actually the sun comes through um, a hole in the roof and indicates the time of day and the day of the year along the floor of the church. Uh, another example of weird Catholic neon <laughs> and the cloister and the monastery buildings. Um, that are part of this, this complex. They, um, they are now actually used um, as buildings for the University of Catania. It's a big uh, student city. So where this once was an actual Benedictine monastery, you'll now see this full of um, Italian college students eating their lunch. But the building is really quite gorgeous inside. Given the proximity of the volcano, which does erupt, in fact, it erupted um, only a, a couple of months before we were there. And I believe I saw something in the news about an eruption um, earlier this month um, around the holidays. Um, it's kind of one of those volcanoes that's continuously erupting, which is probably good because it doesn't build up and then have um, massive eruptions every couple of hundred years. It's kind of always doing it. You can go up the top 
Um, the other program that we're not seeing tonight, I have images of that. It is possible to drive partway up um, and also uh, hike with a guide um, to the actual top of the mountain, but it's a, it's a pretty strenuous proposition, so you need to be in good shape, and definitely it's not something to do on your own. You want to go with um, registered guides who know the mountain. Um, the sign that I'm showing you here is just um, in Italian. In case of an earthquake, this is where um, a meeting point where you're supposed to come out um, to make sure that everybody's okay. Um, and more elegant streets and street life. This is an ancient castle um, now turned into a museum. And it's another example of a place where you can see the, the clear change in the street level because of the past lava flows. Um, Catania also has a really big fish market. You have to get up very early in the morning to get there. Um, and a number of other really nice public street markets as well. This dramatic gate here, which is at the end of Via Garibaldi, was built in 1768 to honor um, the visit of King Ferdinand. And like other buildings in, in the city, it's um, alternates between white limestone and black lava stone for a very dramatic effect. This poor woman, I love, I loved um, <laughs> catching her at this moment where it looks like she's just had too much. <laughs> um, this is the opera house. Um, dedicated to Bellini, who was originally from Catania. And just some more street scenes. At night, um, Catania is lit up beautifully. Um, again, kind of like a stage set. Um, all the public buildings are lit up. All the streets are lit up. And it's a um, great time to just stroll around and be seen and people watch. So I'm going to finish here and leave you with um, some food to look at, because I think that's one of the most important parts of any travel experience, particularly in Sicily. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm we should have, um, I'm happy to spend as much time answering questions as anyone would like. Um, and I'm also in the chat, I'll take a quick look at the, see if there are yeah. any questions, but I'm also going to um, just quickly put my email in the chat so that if you have any questions in the future, you are more than welcome to email me um, and I'll try to help out in any way I can. So if after tonight's over, if you forget, um, and you think of a question a week from now, um, by all means, let me know. Does anybody have any questions tonight or comments? We did have a few earlier on, if I can just sure. go back and, um, and read them Absolutely. out. Absolutely. So um, from Jeanette, um, are the ruins at Ar Agrigento comparative in size to those at Pestum? I have not been to Pestum, but from what I know of it, Agrigento is bigger. Oh, okay. um, the, diff the, the difference I would say is um, that the temple at Pestum is probably in better condition, um, but there are more ruins in Agrigento. So, you know, it's, um, it's different, but both are very, very well-known sites and well worth visiting. Um, and then, sorry, I've got an echo going. Um, and then uh, Margaret asks if uh, you had any book or books recommended about the history of Sicily. It sounds like you might have read quite a few. And also, I, are you planning your own books on your travels? I am not a writer. I am a talker. <laughs> so that's why I do this instead of that. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I did read some very good 
um, histories of Sicily, but I can't remember exactly what they were right now. Um, I'd have to dig out my list and, and let you know. Um, I do remember reading a couple that were specifically about the, um, the 15th century conflict between the Muslim world and the Christian world um, in the naval battles that occurred there, um, much of which happened around Sicily and Malta, mm -hmm. being at the crossroads of everything. Um, and those um, were actually, I'm, I'm not actually that interested in military history. There's only so much of it I can do, but um, at least if there's too much, um, too much of the tactical information. But seeing it in the larger historical context, the book, the book that I can't remember the title of, but I'll find it for you, um, was really good about that. And it put it more in the context of Sicily in the larger world at the time, which I thought was great. Um, and um, if you have not read The Leopard, you must, um, if you have any interest in Sicily. Um, it's fiction, but it is so... Uh, it, it just really gets, just at, really gets at the, the, end of, the end of the end of an era um, as Italy was moving into the modern world. Um, the other thing that I um, would recommend um, for fiction uh, that I mentioned very at the beginning of the program is Luigi Pirandello. And he's great because a lot of his works are very short. So um, you can just dip into him and read a couple of short stories and see whether you like him and it's not a great commitment, but um, a number of his films, uh, uh, of his uh, stories rather, have been made into uh, films by people like the Taviani brothers and other classic Italian filmmakers. And they're very, very typically Sicilian. And then if you want to, if you do find that list or if you have come up with any titles and you want to email them, I can forward them to the group tonight. Sure, I will definitely do that. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, and then someone asked, um, I don't know if you mentioned, you might have mentioned this in the beginning, um, but during which months did you visit this part of Sicily? Um, this was in two years ago in October, mm -hmm. uh, early October. Um, and in general, um, for almost all my travel, um, unless it's a part of the world where it doesn't make sense, but certainly Europe, um, spring and fall are definitely nicer times to go um, because they're either slightly out of season or at least shoulder season. So the prices are less, the crowds are smaller, um, and you have a, a bit more freedom. It, it just, it's a nicer time. And the weather is also much nicer. Sicily, um, Sicily during the high season when people are at the beaches um, would be beastly. The temperature is, is just horrific. You don't want to be there. <laughs> it's hot, it's dry, it's miserable, and it's crowded. Um, whereas if you go in September, October, or May, June, early June, um, the weather is still very nice, but it's not hot. Excellent. Thank you. And also in the fall, you have the advantage of... Um, uh, depending on where you are, you have the advantage of maybe seeing olive harvests and grape harvests, because um, that's the time of year when that starts happening as well. And then in the image where you were um, eating the um, delicious looking salad with the olives, um, mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned the name of a wine um, that what you recommended um, was very good. Gerasuolo um, I loved, but I have not been able to find it here. Okay. Um, Nero Davola, N E R and okay. N E R O. I, I can put it in the chat. Um, grab my mouse. Um, that is um, much more widely um, exported. Whoops, I can't type. Um, mm -hmm. And you can find that in any decent sized wine shop around here. Um, it's very inexpensive. Um, it's not as good as the Cherasuolo, but it's it's very good. If you like rich, robust, like wines that stand up to things <laughs> like olives and um, rich Italian food, it's, um, but you can get really good ones for $10 a bottle. Um, Total Wine definitely carries it. Um, and I know some of the other stores in my neck of the woods 
have have different ones. Um, but I would definitely try a lot of Sicilian wines and also Southern mainland Italian wines because they're so inexpensive. Um, and people tend to focus on the really well-known expensive ones from Tuscany and, and further north. But um, Calabria and um, that whole, the, 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 the boot of Italy and Sicily have a lot of really, really good wines and they're dirt cheap and they're delicious. Good to know, thank you. Um, and then how did you find, uh, Gail was asking how you found the places where you stayed. Do you have any I do all of my planning myself and online. Um, mm -hmm. I make um, liberal use of travel guidebooks um, that might make recommendations. Um, and I, I just spend a lot of time digging through the internet. Yeah. And the advantage to that these days is that um, you can actually, in addition to finding out stuff from the place itself, you can look at Google Earth and see that the beautiful place that you want to stay is actually right across the street from a gas station. And you know, <laughs> their photograph doesn't show that. But so it's, it's a good way to um, really see where you want to be and in relation to other things. Fantastic um, advice, thank you. Um, we, as I said, we drove and the driving in Italy was fine. It's, if you can drive in Boston, you can drive in Italy. Um, particularly in the countryside, there actually aren't that many cars on the road. Navigating the narrow little town streets can be a little hair raising. Um, but other than that, um, it's, it's a delightful place to drive. And so much of the beauty of Sicily is the countryside that, mm. um, the public transport is not real. There's no trains um, that would take you to anything like that. And um, the, there is a bus system, but for tourism, it's very, very limited. So you'd really want a car. Um, if you really don't feel comfortable with that, um, there are certainly tours, organized tours in a bus that would um, take you around a lot of the places that we saw too. I, I don't prefer those myself, but some people it's it's a better option. Sounds like the independence is is worth any effort to get the yeah. car of your yeah. own. If you're if if you're that kind of traveler and you're brave, um, it's well worth the effort to do it. Great. Um, and then I don't think we had any other questions unless anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask anything else. Oh, there is one. Sorry, is it sure. necessary? Is it necessary to speak necessary Italian to speak in Italian? Definitely in not. Town. Okay. Um, it doesn't hurt. Uh, Sicily is a, Italy in general is so touristed mm -hmm. that um, if you're any place that in any way deals with tourists, they're going to speak enough Italian uh, or enough English to be able to cope with you. If you're in a tiny little village in the middle of nowhere, um, there might not be. English, particularly in the older generations. So I always think it's worth it to try to learn, obviously learn a few basic phrases, um, take a little phrase book with you. Um, and again, Italians speak with their hands. So <laughs> that can sometimes work too. Um, if you know any French or Spanish, um, that it, it's not the same, but you'll recognize a lot of that you certainly would be able to understand a lot of written Italian if you have any background with French or Spanish because there's so much that's similar. Um, but in general, um, any of the places that we looked at this evening, um, English, you'll, you'll be fine with English. All right. It is fun to learn new languages though, so. Oh yeah, I think that's part of the fun it. is, yeah. in, and if you can try and meet someone part way where they practice their English and you practice a little Italian, that's, that's part of the fun of traveling is meeting local people and talking to them about their lives and their experiences. Absolutely. Um, so that was all the questions I had in the chat. Um, but if anyone else has any questions, otherwise we had the, um, oh, and I, I did record this and I'll send it out to everyone who's here obviously and also anyone who may have missed it tonight. And um, I suppose we have Jeff's, um, permission Hello? to pass it on to. Sorry. Sure. So, so uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, no, I was just going to say that we, um, I, I guess we have just permission to pass it on to um, any friends or anything, that, um, yep. anyone who might be interested in watching it. Um, and I should have that ready to send out uh, by tomorrow. And then the um, we do not currently have Jeff scheduled for the Northern Sicily program, but we will certainly consider it after this program tonight. And hopefully that'll still make sense doing it um, that way, south and north. Just um, out of curiosity, does, mm -hmm. does Chelmsford have a large um, population of people with Italian heritage? Oh, I, I think so, There's yeah. There's one. <laughs> Giancarla. Yeah. Giancarla, hi. How are Actually, you? I think we, we must be related because you have a, an Italian first name and a Greek last name. So that's kind of like my family. Actually, the last name is um, a truncated uh, Armenian name. Oh, Armenian. Oh, OK. With my husband's you know, background. Uh -huh. so it used to be Kalpasian, but my maiden name is Geminian. Um, Wakefield, where I am, has um, a very large proportion of um, people who uh, have Italian heritage, and most of them, for whatever historical reason, most of it is from Sicily or southern Italy. So um, it's it's I'm a big deal Bologna, in Wakefield. I'm from Bologna, from Emilia Romagna region. Oh, okay. Bologna is beautiful. Yes. <laughs> So I hope to see you in what, maybe three weeks? Yeah, February 3rd. Like the first um, week and, of February. Yep, first Wednesday of February. And um, and Jeff's going to talk to us about the Mani Peninsula in Greece, which um, should be yeah. really fascinating. Definitely yeah. off the beaten path. Yeah. Um, oh, I did I did want to note, um, your the photography is absolutely stunning. So oh, um, thank you. Did you take all those pictures yourself? Yep. Wow, they're wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll pass on a lot of this wonderful positive feedback that we received too. Great, so. thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So I look forward to seeing many of you um, in about a month or so. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good Take night. Care. Stay thank well you. in the meantime.